Hi everyone, so this is uh, lecture 19 on uh, numerical integration using Newton Coates formulas and uh, the outline today is we're gonna uh, start out talking about an introduction to Newton Coates integration um, that's gonna take probably about 25 minutes or so uh, and then I have maybe 30 minutes uh, and then I have some examples uh, on how to do uh, these uh, integrals and I'll hopefully be able to do a real-time example for you both in Python and then in Excel. So let's dive right in. So uh, we're going to talk about newton coates integration formulas first. So uh, in calculus, uh, you learned how to do definite integrals. Okay, so you learn how to evaluate definite integrals like this, where I have some integral from a to b of a function f of x dx. All right, and note that for a definite integral, uh, because I'm integrating from a to b, this is going to return a number. All right, so uh, in calculus, you learn how to do these analytically, so some analytical solution, um, and analytical solution uh, to these problems uh, had various techniques and they ranged in their difficulty level. So uh, for instance if f of x was some kind of polynomial then you had an easy problem. Right? You could uh, integrate x to x squared uh, you could, you know, do something x x uh, x squared over two. If you had x cubed, it would be x to the fourth over four, something like that. So it was easy if it was a polynomial. If f of x was some transcendental function like sine of x or exponential of x, okay, uh, you basically uh, memorized those, right? So there were tables, okay, and you memorized what those guys were. Um, and then if things got a little harder and you started to put combinations of these together, um, you learned some techniques like u substitution uh, or integration by parts. Okay. And then there are some that were just uh, impossible to do, right? So there were some cases that were impossible. So for instance, if you wanted to integrate something like 0 to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx, you'll find that you just can't do that integral. Uh, and so it has to be tabulated, calculated numerically, and then tabulated. All right. So this is related to what's called the error function. I can never remember exactly what the error function is, but um, you know this is related to it. Okay, and you know that's some function that is just this definition of this integral. So we'd like to be able to, instead of, we don't want to do all this stuff, right? So, you know, I'll go up here. We don't want to do this guy. Uh, you know, this is hard. Maybe I'll put my X here. We don't want to have to do an analytical solution. That's a hard thing. We want to be able to do some kind of numerical solution. Okay, so instead, numerical. Maybe we'll put blue happy face for that one. Okay. All right, so uh, one quick thing I wanted to say too about notation before we move on. Uh, a numerical integral, a uh, numerical definite integral like this, is often called a quadrature. Or sometimes you'll see the word numerical prepended to it. Okay. Uh, quadrature is just an old word that means a definite integral, uh, and um, for whatever reason, oh, forgot the C in numerical there. Um, for whatever reason, it's stuck to uh, the case when we're doing numerical integrals. So oftentimes, that, that's at least where I first encountered the word is as a numerical quadrature, or sometimes just people call it a quadrature when they mean a numerical quadrature. Okay. So we want to ask, um, how can we do these kinds of quadratures numerically? So, how solve uh, for i numerically? All right. So I'm going to have i. I'm going to just rewrite it down here. A to b, f of x, 
dx. Okay, so um, there's sort of two steps to this, two pieces of logic that are needed. So the first one is what we what we want to know is that f of x, okay, in general, can't be done, right, by hand, see above, okay, but polynomials can, okay. So if we can turn f of x into some polynomial p of x, then we have a shot right then we have a chance at doing that the second thing is we said uh, last time as a matter of fact uh, we learned that we can we learn how to do this we learned interpolation okay uh, can uh, do this okay we learned that interpolation that we can get some polynomial so we can get some piecewise okay, polynomial right, to approximate uh, f of x. Okay? So let me just draw a little plot to kind of remind us of that. So this is where we gotta test my drawing skills. We'll see if I can do it. So, oh, oh man, terrible start. That one's okay. All right, not great, not good, we'll live with it. So suppose I have some function here. Put my y-axis here, my x-axis here. Suppose my function looks like this, all right? I wanna call this point A and this point over here B. And this then is gonna be F of A right there and this is gonna be f of b right there. So that thing in the middle, right, that's f of x. All right, so what I wanna do is take some uh, polynomial and create an interpolation, right? And remember what, a polynom or what an interpolation does is it says, if all I know is a and b, can I interpolate between those two points? All right, so this is some linear interpolation here. All right, and so the integral under the curve, if I take maybe gray to be the, the integral of the function here, all right, that integral is all this space here, right? All that space under there, all right? So that's the integral equal a to b f of x dx, all right? But what I'm hoping to do is to get this. Now, blue is going to be all this stuff under that curve there. And I'm going to say that that uh, i is now approximately that integral, a to b of p of x dx. Right, and what we're going to see in a minute, so I'm going to do this first for just a single interpolation between these points, but we'll see in a minute how to do it piecewise so we can do an even better job. All right, so let's do an example of this. Let's work out an example of how to do this uh, with a linear interpolation. So example, linear interpolation. All right, so this thing we're getting sick of writing now, a to b, f of x, dx. And I need somehow to interpolate between the point a and f of a and the other point b, f of b. And I'm gonna pick a linear interpolation scheme and if you remember for linear interpolation, what I said was we did equal slopes. That was how we derived it. So I'm gonna take y minus f of a divided by x minus a, 
And so that would give me some point up here, right? So if I picked x, y, that would pick the slope somewhere here, all right? I would say the slope at that point uh, here has to equal the slope f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a, all right? So that's how I do linear interpolation. And I simply need to rearrange this guy to solve for y. So I'm going to say y is equal to, I just multiply by that piece, move it over. So I have x minus a multiplied by the slope, f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a plus the top part on top there, f of a, right? And then this is my polynomial function, p of x. All right, so I've now find, found my polynomial. So I'm gonna come over here to my integral and say that i is gonna approximately be equal to a to b p of x dx, which now becomes the integral from a to b of this function that I'm gonna just copy right over here. Put big square brackets around it. So I'm gonna have f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a plus f of a, close square brackets, dx. All right, so now note that I went from some function I didn't know. I don't know what that function is. It could be sine of x, it could be something crazy. All right, something I can't do like the, the uh, exponential of a Gaussian e to the minus x squared. All right, and I've now approximated it with a linear function. And so I can do this integral, even I can do that by hand, all right? So now I come down here and I just have to evaluate this integral. So I take the integral, now this is just a constant, this is a slope, and this is multiplied by x minus a. So at the end I'm gonna get uh, x minus a squared over two for the linear term. And I have f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a plus, and then when I integrate that one, I get f of a times x, and I'm gonna evaluate this from a to b. So I can work that out. So I plug in a b first to both terms. So I get b minus a squared divided by two multiplied by f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a plus, and then this one should have a b times f of a. Now I subtract the a terms. So the first one I take a and plug it into there, and a minus a is zero, so that whole term becomes zero. So that's nice, I don't wanna to have to rewrite it, so I get a zero. I put an a in there, and I'm gonna get a minus a f of a. Great, okay? Little bit of algebra steps left to go on this, but not too much. Let me just uh, move my notes over to make sure I don't make an algebra error when I double check. Okay, so now, now I look here, I can simplify this. The squared here is gonna cancel with that guy. So I'm gonna get a B minus A divided by two multiplied by F of B minus F of A. All right, and then over here, look, I have a b minus a multiplied by f of a. So this should be plus b minus a f of a. So I can pull out a b minus a from both of them. So I'm gonna do that. Now I'm gonna have a b minus a, okay? And I'm gonna pull out an extra two, and that means I have an extra two there. So I'm gonna have f of b minus f of a, that comes from these two terms. And then this one, I pulled out a one half, so that means I need to put in a two. So I'm gonna have plus two f of a. All right, so now looking at that, that and that can add together and I'm gonna get finally, this is gonna approximately be b minus a divided by two multiplied by f of a plus f of b. Okay, where the plus sign comes from the two canceling out there. All right, so this right here is my final answer. We'll put a little green box around it. Right like that. 
Okay? This is called the trapezoidal rule. You probably have encountered this in calculus before, all right? And this, if we go back and think about our plot that I drew above, ooh, as soon as I try and go a little fast on these lines, screw it up, all right? So remember, I had something like this. My function goes like that, but I just drew a line. What did I do, blue? Blue line in between them, and I said, I'm just going to get the value of the area of that trapezoid right in there, right? Where this is A, B, F of A, F of B. And that area of that trapezoid is right there. That's the same as that area. Okay. So that's the trapezoidal rule. So now I told you that what we'd really like to do when we do... Uh, uh, integration and when we do interpolation is we'd rather have piecewise functions okay so let's put that up here just to remind us so I just uh, just like interpolation we can be more accurate Uh, with piecewise functions. Okay, so we want to, to break up this f of x into a bunch of different pieces and do little trapezoids along all those different pieces. Okay, so if I draw that picture down here Give myself a little more space to draw my curly function. Now I come along and I can put a point here and here and here and here and here and now I draw lines between each of those. All right and now when I do those I'm going to have each of these trapezoids here Okay, and the areas of all those obviously is better than just the one big trapezoid, all right? Now in calculus, you probably learned we're going to take the limit as that goes to infinity and use that to prove an integral. Okay, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to learn this for different points, but then we're also going to learn different interpolating functions than simply a linear case, all right? So I'm going to just label a couple things here. So this point here I'm going to call x0, that's the same thing as a. This point I'm going to call x1 all the way down here, so this will be x2, x3, okay? And I'm going to call this one x n minus 1, because if I have n points, right, I have n minus 1 of them total. And that's going to be the same as b. And so this one up here, for instance, this will be f at x n minus 1. But to avoid writing that, I'm just going to write that as f n minus 1. So I don't have to keep writing the parentheses x n minus 1. So that one's going to be f3. That one's going to be f2, f1, and f0. Right? So this case here, n is equal to what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? So n minus 1, that's f4. All right? So notice that's the same thing as f of b. And this here over here, this one is f of a. It's the same thing as f0. All right? So what we want to do now is go back and see if we can write down our rule for this composite case. Let's see if we can do that. Ah, oh, my notes are a little out of order. Pardon my lack of organization here. So let me make sure I've got black. All right. So now I'm going to write my integral from a to b of f of x dx. And I'm going to say that's going to be a to b of some polynomial of x dx. But this polynomial I said is going to be piecewise. So really what I'm going to do is go from x0 to x1 of p0 of x dx plus 
x1 to x2 of p1 of x dx plus, you know, etc. Let me just put dots there. From x n minus 2 to x n minus 1, p n minus 2 of x dx. All right? So I'm going to keep, you know, adding up these pieces as I go along. All right? And I'm going over these intervals, and now I've broken it up into this piecewise. So now I can go through and write a trapezoidal rule for each one, right? So trapezoidal rule one, trapezoidal rule two, etc. Trapezoidal rule, you know, I guess I should call that one zero. Maybe we'll do that. Trapezoidal rule zero. Trapezoidal rule one, and then trapezoidal rule n minus two. All right. So I need to have n minus two of them to be able to add them all up. Okay. Because if I have five points, I only have one, two, three, four trapezoids. So this one, I can go back and look at my formula right up here and say b minus a over two. This, this, this. So I'm going to have b minus a in this case now is x one minus x0 divided by 2 multiplied by, and then the polynomial is these two points, right? f0 plus f1. So let me write that down there, f0 plus f1. Okay, that's the trapezoidal rule 0. Let me do it for 1. I have x2 minus x1 divided by 2. Uh, and now I have f1 plus f2. Okay, so on and so forth until I have x n minus 1 minus x n divided by 2 multiplied by f, and then I'm going to need that point at the end, n minus 1 plus f n minus 2. Right? So I can make a couple uh, simplifications to this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that this distance there, x1 minus x0, is equal to that distance there. It's equal to x2 minus x1 is equal to all of them. And I'm going to just call that distance delta x. That makes my life a lot easier. I don't have to do that, but I'm going to do that. It's going to make my life easier. So then I can pull a delta x out of all of them. So now I have a delta x over 2. And I can just write each of these pieces down. f0 plus f1 plus f1 plus f2 plus fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. Notice that I get these repeats. So in the end, I'm going to get, let me give myself a little more space down here. I actually don't like those two things. I'm going to just write that my integral is going to be delta x over 2 f0 plus 2f1 plus 2f2 plus whatever plus 2fn minus 1 because there's another one here that comes from the previous one before but I only have one. Oh, excuse me this is backwards here let me fix that that should be I had that as backwards this should be n minus 2 that should be n minus 1 if you were following along carefully maybe you noticed that okay so I have 2fn minus 2 Okay, plus only one fn minus one, right? So that guy is now the trapezoidal rule if I have piecewise functions, all right? And we call that the composite trapezoidal rule, okay? Or I'm going to keep writing it CTR, okay? So Choose the right, just kidding, uh, composite trapezoidal rule. All right, so I just do that so I don't have to keep writing that uh, composite trapezoidal rule. All right, so that's how you do uh, these more accurate integrals <clears throat> where you do piecewise interpolations. So now what happens, our last thing we'll talk about in this piece. So um, what about other interpolating functions.
Okay, I, you know, we had lines, that's what we just did, but what about uh, quadratic? Okay, what about cubic? What about all those guys? All right, so uh, I'm not going to take the time here, but you can do the same process, right? So uh, if I have three points, okay, I can make a quadratic between them. And then I can put that quadratic, you know, now I get some polynomial of x that has ax squared plus bx plus c. Now I put that into my integral from a, you know, I guess a to b is the wrong thing to use because I just used it there. But you get the idea, a to b, and then I have my x squared terms and my x and my other term in here, right? And I integrate those, and I can do that in a piecewise manner and add them up, okay? So for quadratic, I get the following formula. I get i is approximately delta x divided by 3 times f0 plus 4f1 plus 2f2 plus 4f3 plus 2f4 plus dot 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 plus 4fn minus 2 plus fn minus 1. All right, so this one, notice that there's the endpoints, right? So the endpoints still have just one coefficient. Okay, odd numbers have four, and evens have factor of two. Okay, so this is called uh, Simpson's one-third rule. Notice the one-third. That's where the one-third comes from in the Simpson's one-third rule. So that's the case for quadratic. What if I use cubic? In the cubic case, right, I now I have to have four points, right? One, two, three, four. Oh, that's terrible. But you get the idea, all right? I have four points, I connect them, plug in something cubic, go through the same procedure, I get the following formula. 3 delta x divided by 8, square bracket, f0 plus 3f1 plus 3f2 plus 2f3 plus 3f4 plus 3f4. 5 plus 2, f6 plus, keeps repeating, okay, until f n minus 1. Okay, so notice the pattern here. So here I have a coefficient of 1, which is the same as on the end point here, coefficient of 1, all right, and then it goes 3, 3, 2, 3, 3, 2, okay, so every third one, is a two, okay? Every third coefficient is a two, right? So this one here, this is called also Simpson, okay? Simpson's three-eighths rule, right? And Simpson's three-eighths rule is pretty good. People like to use it uh, for reasons that we won't uh, talk about. It has uh, bet better accuracy than quadratic. Probably makes sense, right? It has better accuracy. People really like Simpson's 3 8 rule. It gives you pretty good integrals. All right, so there you go. Like I said, uh, it took about a uh, half hour or so to cover that. That is all I'm going to say about um, Newton Coates formulas. Ah, except I should tell you, which I didn't tell you, okay, all of these things, so this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here, all three of those are called Newton Coates formulas. So they are called Newton Coates formulas. Right? So this is a way of doing integration by using polynomial uh, interpolation functions and then uh, using them to, to do the integral. That's a Newton Coates formula. You could continue. You could keep going this up to higher and higher order. Uh, and try and get better and better approximations. It seems that cubic is pretty good 
trade-off between the simplicity to do an interpolation and uh, the ability to uh, get an accurate integral. So cubic seems to be uh, often right. Uh, on our homework, uh, we do a lot of trapezoidal rule too. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn my attention to section two and do some examples. All right, and uh, I'm gonna do a Python, I'm gonna do both, I'm gonna do Python and Excel. All right, and what I'm gonna do for you is an example where I'm gonna find this value, I'm gonna solve the integral from zero to one of sine of pi x and cosine squared of pi x dx. All right, I'm gonna evaluate that integral numerically. And it turns out you can do by hand. So uh, by hand, the exact answer gives you two over three pi, right? So you could go ahead and maybe figure out how to do this. You should probably, I think you can do this by substitution, right? Substitute, cosine, and I think you can do use substitution there and, and solve for this guy. It's kind of fun exercise. Go ahead and prove that to yourself. Um, that that's two over three pi. But I'm gonna go ahead and do this numerically and it's nice you can do this by hand so we can um, help, that we can use this to check our answer. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and see that. So let me put that away for a second, grab my keyboard. And click save, scroll down here. All right, so I'm gonna do this for you from scratch. I've given you uh, an example that you can uh, look and follow along. So if it's a little different than the example, um, you'll know why. So uh, the first thing we should do, of course, is import numpy. Um, and uh, what I need to do is set up, uh, so I'm, I'm saying here I wanna do this with 10 points. So let me say number of points is equal to 10. And I want to create a linearly spaced array for these x values to do this composite over those 10 points. So I'm going to use a lin space to do that. So my limits are from 0 to 1 and I want to do 10 points. Great. Um, and so I'm going to also want to know the delta x. So I can get that pretty easy here by doing x1 minus x0. And let me just run that to make sure nothing's broken. So I look at x and it has, it's giving me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 points. And dx is 0.111, which is clearly what the delta x is. Okay, great. So the next thing is um, I need to define my function because I need to evaluate it at those different points, right? So to do that, let me define my function f of x uh, and Oops, it's gonna be numpy dot sine of pi times x multiplied by numpy dot cosine of pi times x where that guy is squared, square the cosine, All right? That's the function. So now what I need to do, so if we come back and look up here at the formula, I need to do this sum. I need to sum up f0 and then two times f1, two times f2, etc. So I need to do a sum. Well, how do we do sums? We do sums with loops. So I'm gonna do four uh, i in range from zero. Well, I just need to do a number of points, right? i in range of the number of points. And if I remember here, so I'm gonna have i, I'll make that my value for my sum. So i is gonna equal zero at the beginning. And then I'm gonna add up stuff in i, uh, and you know that's what I'm gonna do. So the first thing I need to add is f0. So if i equals zero, then I'm gonna make i add on f of x zero, okay? Um, else if i is equal to n points minus one, that's my other n down here, then I'm also gonna add in 
f at x of i, right? I can actually make this i because that will be zero there, that will be n minus one, then I don't have to retype n minus one, okay? But if, oh, I need a colon there. If I'm not those two endpoints, my formula says I need a two in front. So I need to add up two times f of x at i, okay? So I'm gonna add, oh, I need to put the plus equals together there. So I'm going to add up f of x on the two endpoints, and I'm going to add up f of x times 2 in the middle. Okay, and then I look down here, and I need to multiply by delta x over 2 at the end. So I do that at the end of the loop. I don't want to do that in the loop, or else I'm going to be doing it every time. And I could put them in front here if I wanted. Um, that would just be the same as distributing this in every place. But that's more operations. This is... Uh, only one time I'm multiplying by delta x over 2, so that's easier. Okay, so now I can print, uh, let's see, the trapezoid, composite trapezoidal rule answer, and that will be i, and I can also print the exact answer, which is 2 divided by 3 times pi. Make sure my parentheses are okay, and run the thing. Okay, and I get an answer, and it's 0.21. It's pretty close. I can look at the difference if I wanted. So I could print the percent error. And actually, let me do, I'm going to call this the relative error. So the relative error is going to be equal to let me have i exact, so I don't have to keep typing this. i exact will be this piece right here. So now I can type i exact. And what I'm going to do is do i minus i exact quantity divided by i exact. And I need to add an open parenthesis. Right? So, and I can even put an absolute value there around that. So what that should do is it should just take the difference between the answer I got, the exact answer, divide by the exact answer, and it'll show me about how different it is. That's a relative error. So this tells me I have a 3% error. So I'm pretty close. So let's see what happens if I increase the points. So now I can go up to 20 points and run it. And now I get out to... Uh, almost the third decimal place, right? And now I'm down to a 0.7% error. I can try and increase it even more, let's say 50 points. Now I'm down to a 1% error. Now I'm getting it about right in the third decimal place, or 0.1% error, right? So third decimal place, 0.1% error, that makes sense for a number that's on order one. And if I go out to 100, I can get out now to a 0.02% error, and I'm starting to look pretty good, right? So for this relatively simple function, I actually have to have a lot of points, even between 0 and 1, to get a pretty good integral, all right? So that's one reason why you might use Simpson's rule, is that you might not need as many points to cover as you do for the trapezoidal rule. All right, so that's the case for uh, Python. Let me scroll down here, and let's do the same thing for... Uh, Excel. So in the Excel case, uh, note that I'm going to, the first thing I did here was I set up a linearly spaced array. So let me set up i from 0, 1, 2, and I want to do down to 10. 79, 10. Oh, actually, I only need to go to 9, right? Because this one, uh, if I have 10 points, I'm only going to go to 9 right there. All right, and then I need to create my linearly spaced array. So that's a little harder in Excel. I have to code that by hand. So how do I go about doing that? Well, what I need to do is I need to have the slope of this x value that I need. So I'm going to have the slope be 1 minus 0, because that's the endpoints I'm going to have in my, uh, that I'm creating my array from. And then I need to divide by the number of points um, that are in that 
uh, uh, thing here, okay, and what I need is 10 minus 1 points, all right, because I have that many little line segments in between, so I need 9 of them. So I'm going to do, that's my slope, then I'm going to multiply that by i, right, so I have x in the numerator and then i in the denominator and multiply by i, it's kind of like a unit conversion, you can think of it like that, or I have my slope delta x over delta i times i, right, and that's going to give me a zero on that first one. And then I just copy and paste down here. And you notice, I'll just go ahead and drag. But you notice if I copy and paste down, I'm going to go between zero and one with that delta x that I showed before. All right? So we can double check and make sure that we have it right. If we change this guy back to 10 and put in, oh, we got to run it once. Put in x there. You can see that I have the same numbers going on here. All right. Now I need to evaluate f of x, right? So I need to be able to plug that in and evaluate f of x at all of these different points. So this is going to be uh, sine of pi. Remember that pi is a function in Python times x multiplied by cosine of pi times x. And that cosine is going to be squared with a different way of doing squared in Excel. And I can copy and drag that one down. Now I've evaluated the function at all those points. And if I want to check that to my previous answer, let's note that like 0.302, I can go look at Python up here and I can do F evaluated on that array of X values and I get the same thing back and lo and behold I get 0.302 or 3.02 times 10 minus one. All right. So now I need to evaluate the integral, okay? So I need the piecewise values of i. So let's look back at our formula. So remember up here, I did these little piecewise pieces where I said x1 minus x0 over 2 times f0 plus 1, x2 minus x1 over 2, f1 plus f2. So in that derivation, I had these little chunks. And that's what I can code in to Excel right here. I can do x1, I'm going to put a parenthesis first, x1 minus x0 divided by 2 multiplied by the sum of these two, right? f0 plus f1. And that same thing is going to apply at this point, right? So now this one is going to have that c14 minus c13, that delta x over 2, multiplied by the sum of those guys. So those are all the pieces that I need to add up. So I can just drag that down. And then if I want the total integral, i, it's going to be the sum of that column right there. And you notice that gives me 0 0.205648. And if I look at i, I got 0 0.205648. Same answer. So now one of the disadvantages of Excel here, besides having to hard code the uh, this x in, uh, one of the disadvantages is it's not as easy to just increase the number, right? So if I wanted to make this go out to 20 points, suppose I drag this down now to 19 so that I have 20 points in there, uh, this has now changed my range. So I need to modify this value of x so that instead of 10 minus 1, I have 20 minus 1. Now I need to double click that down. So this still needs to go between 0 and 1, all right? Um, and then when I do that, I also need to modify this sum so that the sum is over the whole range. So I close that all the way down. And now I get the answer 0 0.2107. And if I put a 20 in here, run that one, I get 0 0.2107, all right? So I can do it. I have to copy and paste it down. I have to make sure I change the column of x and change the sum to make sure I'm getting all of the piecewise parts. These parts are going to get smaller, right, because I'm shrinking that trapezoid down, but the answer uh, is the sum of all of them, right? And of course, in calculus, you learn how to do this, where you take the limit as that goes to infinity, right? So if I took an infinite number and added them up, I would get the exact answer, and I would converge to that answer uh, in the end, right? So that's kind of satisfying to look at if I may put like a thousand points in, right? Now you can get really exact, you know, and you can play around with this all day.
okay, and start to get the thing down to be really exact. But notice it's actually converging sort of uh, logarithmically. I have to increase this by powers of 10 to get this to go down by powers of 10. So um, it's not logarithmic, it's algebraic uh, convergence, but you know, I have to increase this by a lot. So it turns out there's actually better methods for doing these kinds of integrals um, and we will use some of them uh, in the hard-coded stuff in Python next time. All right, so I'm just checking my time, but it looks like I'm out of time. So uh, just review really quick. So what did we do? I told you we were going to learn about some ways to do integration um, and uh, to do it numerically. And what the key idea we learned was that we wanted to substitute this function for a polynomial because polynomials are easy to integrate by hand. And what kind of polynomials did we do? We used the idea of an interpolation uh, to get the, inter the, the polynomial functions we were going to integrate. Then we took that and we plugged them in and actually did the integral and we came up with these rules. And depending on the kind of interpolation we did, we either got out the composite trapezoidal rule or we got out these composite Simpsons rules with either quadratic or cubic functions. And I said cubic are particularly nice. And we did an example in Python and Excel. So I hope that was useful for you. I hope it helps you a bunch with your homework. And I hope you come to appreciate a little bit more the numerical tools you have uh, for doing numerical integration. Have a good one.